good evening good afternoon good morning dear viewers wherever in the world and whichever time zone you may be in welcome to this panel discussion organized by euclid management consultants which is part of a two day virtual discussion with the sector known as convergence 2021 and based on the theme financial inclusion in the digital era having given you the introductory uh, remarks i will now like to introduce you to our very valued panelists that we have today first of all of course ladies first so we have rubaba gawla who is the managing director uh, country head of uh, oracle bangladesh limited and her great experience in telecommunications is a matter of record and so many other things she has accomplished she's one of the leading ladies of this country in the professional world then is followed by my very dear salim hussain who has been a long time colleague of mine in the olanz greenlace and standard chartered bank and also in the association of bankers bangladesh of which he is currently the uh, vice chairman i am very happy he has accepted the position after such a long time and of course he is the managing director and ceo of brack bank which he is leading very effectively and last but not least again my very dear brother and friend and colleague uh, professor shah mahmud hasan habib who is direct director training bibm who is a great expert in research and has written many articles and books in which i envy very much his uh, accomplishments and future accomplishments too uh tirtham dev of euclid consultants has been very kind in organizing and getting this together it's a lot of hard work i know so thanks to euclid consultants for bringing us here uh, we are very pleased to be here so let's get it rolling the theme today is onboarding the next 10 million banking customers so this quite a theme and professor asan habib will have the updated statistics on what is the percentage of the unbanked population better than me because he does all that research but the last that i saw is that i leave it at that less than half the country's population is banked so you can see that there are great opportunities that lie as bangladesh graduates to a middle income country and our per capita income rises and more and more people find employment in the workforce so the field is wide open for banks then uh, mobile financial services asian uh, you know banking centers and so on that we have got now so it should be fairly be good as we go along to get an onboard customers by the banks uh i'll come to first to uh, rubaba uh, rubaba you are in the digital field you are, and i'm very happy that oracle the world's leading you know software hardware so many other you know solutions they have for the world the whole world uh, they have opened an office and they selected you uh, to lead it began you know everybody in the country very well and you will be able to you know cooperate so well with the banks as their main frames uh, core banking systems so that they are capable and sturdy enough and also has enough security to be able to onboard the next 10 million customers so uh, you may like to make a few remarks now just a opening remarks uh, then i will go on to salim hussain and asan habib who will then come up with various points on which you can then respond from the digital side so rubaba dawla uh, thank you very much uh, anis bhai uh, for a very interesting question and i think it's need of the hour for us to discuss about financial inclusion as per the world bank report globally there are about 1.7 billion people who are financially excluded and as we all know that the bulk majority comes from emerging markets like indonesia india bangladesh and uh, pakistan and uh, i feel that financial inclusion uh, or digital inclusion is a fundamental right just like food water and shelter so if we look at uh, why uh, we still have such huge population who are excluded financially then i think there is a combination of reason that we can look into i would like to mention a few which is uh, the trust deficit on formal banking economy uh, the other one is of course the uh, lack of technological awareness and use of it uh, then we uh, also often hear that the lack of regulation especially when it comes to catering to the new segment that we want to bring into the banking population and the stringent and cumbersome process of opening a bank account has often uh, created a barrier you know for the next uh, uh, segment to come in uh, to this banking sector and last but not the least the lack of modern digital plays 
uh, that can enable a connected ecosystem, right? Now, having, having discussed these five points, what I would like to also uh, mention is that one of the main reasons is, of course, the lack of knowledge in utilizing technology. Because in this era, and we have seen post-pandemic and even during pandemic now, that the, uh, all the industries have actually accelerated, right, when it comes to digital transformation. And so has financial sector and banking sector. So it's extremely important for us to understand what kind of technology we can use uh, to um, bring in the next segment or rather the 10 million more customers into the banking sector. So I'm looking forward to the discussion today along with all the experts. And definitely I will highlight what kind of technology can be used and are being used by different banks across the world and what can we learn from them. And also talk about the data, which is an asset. And that's the new currency. And what can we do with that in this in this modern uh, day? So I look forward to the discussion. Thank you, Rubaba. Those were very, very good, excellent opening uh, remarks. And you made some very good five points. And we'll be dwelling on them as we go along. So let me, without further ado, I'd like to bring in Asan Habib first, Professor Asan Habib. Then Salim can uh, then you know join in from the practical point of view, having heard uh, from the digital world and having heard from the training world. So, yeah. Professor Asan Habib, uh, you have done all this research. First, that I would really like you to share with the viewers is that the unbanked population, the percentage, the latest figures that you have, uh, that would be wonderful. And some any other remarks that you may wish to make. Uh, thanks, thanks, sir. Thanks for inviting me. Uh, the data that we have currently, according to the available information, basically the latest information is for the year 2018 that we have. And according to that, uh, the number is 40. We have got 47% adult population that are financially included. By this time, the figure could be around 50% or so. But very importantly, if we uh, consider the title of today's program, the way you have posed the question to me, we are talking about the quantity. But the time has come that we should talk about the quality now. Because maybe in the coming days, uh, with the adoption of technology, we'll have 100% inclusion, 100% added inclusion. Because to be included, simply you need a mobile phone, you need to transfer money from one account to another account. It doesn't mean that you are truly included. So till now we talked about quantity, number, even the title of today's program is about number. But now we want to, we, we are, I am really very interested about quality of inclusion. We want data, how, what is the number of payment inclusion? What is the number of deposit inclusion? And what is the um, percentage of people that are having access to credit? Now, this is the time. Let us talk about the quality of inclusion. More about quality, less about quantity for future. So thank you for the time being. Excellent point. I really like your point on quality. Because as you said, having reached a certain mass, we must then strive for quality. And as you said, more of more accounts to have more money in it and more use, more use of the digital means so that you have more money left in. As we have come along with the financial inclusion measures that have Bangladesh Bank had ushered in and which, of which we had had a front seat working, Salim, myself, and so many others, is that we have gone and opened accounts for farmers. We've gone and opened accounts for senior people. There are special dedicated schemes for ladies, students, uh, special people, all sorts of products have been packaged, uh, you know, by banks. So let me then take this to Salim Hussain, the CEO of Brack Bank Limited, along with uh, his comments on the quality aspect. That means that he means more inclusion of the credit process. And also the fact that till today, there is no private personal national credit bureau where you, you know, log up your own credit score by your good conduct in payments from your bank account. Till today, we don't have it. So now, Salim Hussain, your valuable comments, please. Thank you, Anis um, uh, Financial inclusion is the reason why Brack Bank was spawned almost exactly 20 years ago. Um, it was launched by Sir Fazle Hassan Abed, the founder of Brack, and our founder chairman as well, who sadly passed away in end 2019. 
Uh, I remember asking Sir Abid when I joined Brack Bank about six years ago. I mean, what? Why Brack Bank? What is our identity? What? Why are we here at all? And what are we? Are we a development organization? Are we a commercial bank? And he was very clear about uh, about that purpose. He said to me that uh, uh, he launched this bank with a vision to to to. Um, progress the BRAC's overall financial inclusion agenda. A great deal had already been done with BRAC itself, BRAC, the uh, microfinance institution for 40 odd years. But he next, he felt there was a strong need for the missing middle, which is the SME client segment, to now, who had now uh, needed banking services, who were migrating from uh, MFIs to banking services, he needed a bank. He felt the country needed a bank to service this clientele. And over the last 20 years, that is exactly what Bank Bank has uh, uh, been doing. Uh, today, if you look at the bank, all, over 50% of our customer assets are located in that segment. Uh, but what we also should not forget is that other than SME, even the retail segment has a large uh, volume of lower income uh, uh, group uh, uh, customers as well, whom we have targeted. Now, why couldn't we in the banking sector do this three or four years ago? And why have we just started to do it? And the reason is very simple. Firstly, I think Rubaba mentioned the regulations were very difficult. And those regulations, very thankfully, are now being changed by the central bank. Um, technology was needed because it was very expensive to run a uh, uh, a small account or a lower income uh, uh, group customer out of a branch, a brick and mortar branch. Now we are able to do it out of multiple solutions, a banking app, internet banking, agent banking, et cetera, et cetera. But we weren't able to do that uh, three or four years ago. And the cost of onboarding and maintaining a customer was just too prohibitive. So um, we, and of course, as as I think uh, Asan Bhai mentioned, um, the pandemic, if it's had one positive outcome, it's the fact that it has significantly accelerated the overall digital agenda in Bangladesh and in fact, across the world as well. So what has happened now on East by is that the banking sector, one and all, have started investing heavily in technology. Some banks perhaps lead that initiative, others are a bit behind, but everybody now recognizes that they have to invest heavily in technology to move forward and onboard and offer different kinds of banking services to many, many more customers other than those available only in Dhaka and Chittagong. Therefore, small towns and villages, uh, uh, we have lots and lots of customers there. And how do we onboard those customers in a commercially viable manner? That is the objective and that's the vision many, if not most banks are already pursuing. Thank you, Salim. You very rightly talked about the uh, SME, the missing middle, which your bank is very active in and all the other banks also have to be active in as per regulation of the central bank. And uh, I myself as you are very aware, have also had a lot of opportunities to work in that segment. So it's been very interesting. Also, it's part of the segment also devise, you know, devising and, you know, showcasing products for lady entrepreneurs and educating them. So that's come quite a long, long way. So COVID-19 is an agent of change. It has ushered in transition in the world, transformation in the world. In the past, when we read political history, we have seen revolutions happen, which changed the course of history. You have the examples of the European reformation with the Protestant religion coming in. And then you have the Renaissance coming in and the unification of Italy uh, and Germany uh, and so on. So we are going through that era. People call it the new normal. And we think that the old ways of doing things will never come back. So digital is it, and digital has to work. And recently, certain banks, a number of banks have opened, uh, that has opened you know, certain schemes whereby you can log on and then open an account without going to the bank, which has been a fantastic you know, move forward. Also in the digital world, uh, when you want to bring in a mainframe, you spoke about the cost, Salim. So when you talk, talk about the co cost, it is it's a big cost for a bank. 
especially for the new banks who come in who don't have much profits to invest in this state of the art mainframe. Because I know that uh, before I left uh, MTB, uh, I had not completed the project, but I had, uh, you know, ushered in the new poor banking system, which has been implemented recently very successfully. I'm happy about that. But Rubaba, my question and my worry here was that it took a very long time of this, uh, you know. Uh, that bank was Mutual Trust Bank. It had nearly a million customers. It had various branches and subsidiaries and agent banking centers and ATMs and credit cards. So putting that all together took a very long, long time. So why should it take so long for only a million customers? I think of the State Bank of India. And I think of HDFC. I think of the Indian mega banks and the American banks. I'd rather not talk about it. And how do they manage? Uh, then why is it so difficult for us? And why should it be difficult for us? I don't think it should be difficult to onboard the next 10 million customers to you. Absolutely, absolutely not. Um, uh, and Anisba, as you know, we are operating in more than 140 countries across the world, right? And we have large portion of banking customers in our portfolio. And what we're seeing is that uh, a massive technological transformation in the financial sector is happening, especially of the larger banks who have been using legacy platforms and uh, technologies, right? And the reason why they're now going through this transformation is of twofold. One is the changing customer expectation. And the second is improved technological capabilities, right? What you're referring to is the scale, right? Why aren't we growing at that high speed or scale yet? What, what we see is that the rising uh, competition of fintech also forced the larger banks to respond by utilizing innovative technologies, right? Because they're taking customers in millions. How are they doing that? And also the threat of uh, cybersecurity breaches means that banks need to be much more agile, right? When it comes to taking care of security, uh, data, and also making sure that they're providing the right kind of transparent uh, services to their customers. Now, if you talk about technology, what can be used for scaling? We are seeing more and more usage of BI, business intelligence, okay? What that's doing is helping all these banks to make use of this large, this massive uh, structured and unstructured data that they have. And being able to be predictive, being able to understand what's the next move for, the, for their customers, being able to see that what's the actual next demand from the customers and help them with those kind of services. The other thing is the combination of cloud computing. Now, cloud computing is the real answer, if you ask me. And if you uh, uh, ask me how banks can actually grow to the next level, what are we talking about? Can, can banks actually now register 50,000 customers a day? or maybe 1.5 million customers a month. What do we need for that? For that, we actually need technologies like cloud computing, which enables them to scale up at any level. Whatever demand you have, you pay as you go, you scale up as per the resources that's required. And on top of that, it's actually uh, bringing in more cost efficiency because for us to really grow at that level, for larger banks who've got those leg legacy platforms, they need really efficient platforms, which will help them for scalability, for availability, and of course, for manageability. And that's where this cloud uh, computing helps. Another thing I would say is that we see more and more use of artificial intelligence, okay? You must have heard about that. Uh, we talk about industry 4.0, we are already sitting there, we're utilizing all these um, uh, technology. And AI will actually help us to become much more efficient, whether it's back office operation or uh, front office operation, or being able to be more customer centric with our products and services. Because what we are trying to do is we are trying to mimic the human interaction, right? So these kind of intelligent brought together, utilizing ML, uh, machine learning, we can really go to the next level and cater to this segment. And uh, Selim Bhai was just saying that it becomes very expensive to cater to such segment where you know that the ticket size would be probably much more smaller, right? And for that, integrating the entire ecosystem is extremely important, which means that we have to integrate with those kind of service providers where the next level of the segment or market or the youth are already uh, uh, operating and making use of those services. Only then when we integrate the ecosystem, we'll be able to create that kind of value, which will be more lifestyle products for these uh, customers, right? It's not only about credit card. It's not only about uh, current account and savings account. There's much more to it that needs to be integrated into the uh, system. So Baba, those were excellent points and a wide range of points, uh, subjects that you have touched on, uh, which the fourth industrial revolution has ushered in with machine learning, cloud computing, 
uh, and so on. Uh, so that then will bring me to back to Professor Hassan Habib, who's in the training domain. So with all those new concepts coming in, of which our people have, uh, or our bankers have very little knowledge or training in. So Hassan, how do we move forward then in making aware our bankers and the aspiring young bankers also these curriculum need also to be taken into the universities you know i teach fourth year bbu students at uh, banking and finance at iub maybe in going forward what Baba just said i should be including at least an introduction of these subjects to the young minds the future senior ceos of bangladesh in their minds i should also be doing it voluntarily tasan you are in the structured uh, organization BIBM, which is the country's very unique institution, uh, making uh, training bankers to be more advanced. What do you feel about your own institution touching and teaching with workshop, etc., cetera, uh, what Baba just touched on? Hassan. Okay, so, so I want to see that uh, from broader perspective a bit, uh, because uh, the issue is uh, it's not a supply side issue only; it's a demand side issue as well. Uh, because nowadays you see what we are doing from the technology perspective. It's true that supply is supposed to create its own demand, but thing has already changed. We are supplying a lot using technology sometimes, when, but we are not getting right kind of responses from the demand side. From BIBM, yes, we are trying to accommodate technological concepts, issues, modes, transactions, processes as part of our training programs in line with the, the, the technology modes that are available in the market. But the main challenge at this moment uh, is basically the demand side, I personally believe. Yes, supply side has got its own challenges, no doubt. But I mean, supply side, we are already addressing supply side. They, they, uh, they are getting attention of the policymakers. But think about the demand side. They are hardly responding. Even in the context of COVID-19, somehow demand side responded, responded because the situations forced them to do so. Otherwise, you see, even our literacy rate improved, our rate of inclusion improved, but what about our financial literacy rate? They remain almost stagnant. What about the technology uh, uh, digital literacy rate? That hardly improved. Even the even educated person like me and so many other people, they are hesitant, confused about using technologies today, because I want to get my things done by third person. My assistant is supporting me in opening an account, doing some financial transactions. But if I technology, I have to do it by myself. So we need that kind of awareness. You see. Uh, uh, even, even uh, we, as we do not have, many of us do not have financial literacy from the very childhood, I get myself educated to get a good employment. But unfortunately, if financial literacy would have been there from the very first day, what it covers practically? Investment, entrepreneurship, savings, taxes, personal financial management, that, mean, that means entrepreneurship issues, investment issues are comprehensively missing in our demand side. I can give a recent, very recent example. Think about the uh, migrants who have returned in recent time in the context of COVID-19. That number is more than four lakh. Now, Probashi Kollan Bank uh, uh, is, is distributing credit. It assigned with a credit of 200 crore, particularly for the target group. But demand side is not coming up. They are simply going to the bank, they're asking for the credit because they don't understand the difference between the demand for credit and desire for credit. They believe that I need fund, I'll go to the bank and bank will offer me the fund. That, but demand, you have to be bankable first. You have to understand and, and, and that what, what is the difference between demand and desire? You have to be bankable. And that these basic things we, we are supposed to get as part of financial literacy as part of our primary level education, as part of our uh, curriculum in the university. I recently heard that government has taken initiative to include all this financial literacy, literacy aspects as part of our curriculum. I think that is a remarkable initiative. 
that is a remarkable initiative. So I personally believe alongside uh, having this kind of elements, components as part of our training capacity development programs targeting our supply side, we need comprehensive efforts to support demand side by offering aggressive financial uh, literacy. And then only we can, we can expect uh, some positive changes. Thank you. Excellent points, uh, Asan Habib. I really like the point you made about demand side. And uh, then I think back that every year the Bangladesh Bank and Salim will testify to that. They set targets for banks that you must distribute so much of your portfolio as SME loans, so much of your portfolio as agricultural loans, so much of your portfolio in green banking and so on, and other types of loans. There is a stricture. And if you don't, Bangladesh Bank takes the money away from your account with them and keeps it in another separate account and only gives it back to you. After in the next year, you have disbursed the last year's deficit and this year's target. It's only then they return. So Bangladesh Bank has tried very hard, but as you said, there is a problem from, about the demand. There are not enough lady entrepreneurs that the banks could find, that there's not enough qualified, as you just said, qualified, they could find. Maybe demand is not there. Maybe they are not financially literate to come and apply. They don't know how to apply. So in the, with these things, uh, Salim will be in the forefront to be able to address these issues. But one thing that I will just touch on is that one little story I will share that when I was very young and I was in class four and five in some classic school, Chittagong, uh, every month I saw a fortnight uh, that, that, that was the United Bank of Pakistan. So this is, which is today's, I think, Habib, Janata Bank. So some officers would come from there to the school and they all opened school banking accounts for us in that time in the mid sixties. And I know that every week or every fortnight, I would put in three rupees or four rupees or five rupees in my dad account and they would give me a passbook and I would see it grow. So my financial literacy or my friends in the school, it grew like the current governor was like a beer, was my class friends and placid. So all our financial awareness about banking that we should have a bank account grew from that time. So that school banking concept is excellent which the banks are doing now. So having shared the story, Salim, so we go over to the financial literacy, the literacy by the, from the customer side, from the banker side, also about digital literacy. Salim. Thank you, Anish Bhai. It's a very valid point. Um, the lack of uh, education in terms of financial, financial literacy at a school going age, uh, that it certainly does impact uh, general uh, uh, banking services in Bangladesh. I find even sometimes with um, educated people who've been working for 10, 15 years, their understanding of basic banking services, for example, a checkbook, how to write out a check, et cetera, et cetera, is relatively uh, quite poor, particularly compared to say our neighboring country where most people tend to be financially quite savvy. Um, so that definitely is very, very important. Um, the other thing is, is if we really want to uh, digitalize our banking sector, where do we need to invest? If we think about that, firstly, we need resources. And therefore, we need investment in this. In fact, Bangladesh needs to invest in science and technology in colleges and in, in schools, in colleges and universities. We need many, many more graduates many more engineers in all these different sciences that Rubaba and Asan Habib just spoke about, if the country is to continue to grow. Because in today's world, you need digital professionals in a host of different um, um, uh, sciences and, and expert expertises. So that is very, very important. The second aspect is, is when we spoke about, and Rubaba spoke, you spoke, Anis Bhai, about the cost of investment. Obviously, there is an enormous amount of understanding that is needed and commitment that is needed from bank boards. The investment in technology that Brad Bank has made over the last three years, roughly 30 to $40 million every year, only started off in 2018. And we needed a good year, 18 months to be able to convince our board of what was needed because the costs were very, very significant. And we actually had to take them to, to uh, a neighboring country, to Singapore actually, to see how a certain 
uh, top rated, very creative, innovative bank, what they had been doing. And when our board, some of our board members saw that, they recognized that what the Brack Bank management locally in Bangladesh were uh, propagating was very much a, a aligned to what international banks were doing. And then they came back and gave us the go ahead to start investing. So we started investing from 2019 onwards and the costs are significant. So unless the board makes that kind of long-term investment, and it's not just in hardware and software, it has to be in tech, no, in, in tech people, tech savvy resources. It has to be in processes, is, has to be in products and services which will be uh, underpinned by technology. So overall, an enormous amount of investment that the banks boards will have to commit to. And unless that happens, these banks will very quickly find themselves to be as, as irrelevant as dinosaurs were a million years ago. But uh, coming back to, again, um, the financial literacy aspect that Asan Habib spoke about, I am happy to say that in the last year or so, as we have seen um, the digital transformation in Bangladesh move forward very significantly, the central bank too ha and, and some of the other regulators have also progressed. There are new regulations in terms of EKYC, for example, whereby a customer can onboard himself into a mobile financial service very, very quickly. And the banking service for a similar capability has also been launched recently in a number of banks. I know Bragg Bank will be offering that same capability by, by August or September this year as well. So the cost of opening a bank account will be much, much cheaper. And it may be a different kind of bank account whereby a customer need not uh, um, uh, walk into a ba bank branch at all and could operate out of a mobile or uh, operate out of an agent banking solution using uh, a facial recognition or, 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 or a, a, a biometric fingerprint um, uh, uh, a validation, some that kind of capability, et cetera, et cetera. So all that is happening. And I think you will find that there will be a very, very significant acceleration in terms of onboarding many, many more customers in the next two or three years. Where I think we are still lacking a bit, Anis Bhai, is in terms of the regulatory framework, which is beyond the central bank itself. As you know, the central bank is one very important and the main regulator for the banking sector, but there are other regulators, uh, such as the SEC, for example. There is the NBR, there is the uh, Register of Joint Stock Companies, and very importantly, there are the courts. The legal jurisdiction is very, very important. How long will we, to the best of my knowledge, Anis Bhai, um, uh, there is no regulation uh, law in this country which has done away with wet signatures and has replaced wet, a wet signature with a customer's biometric or digital signature. So that kind of legal reform must also take place in this country. And we look forward to that happening in over the next uh, year, 18 months. And once that does happen, I think you'll find this entire um, um, agenda of including many more customers from tow small towns and villages in basic banking services, that agenda will move forward very, very quickly indeed. Thank you, Salim. Uh, dear viewers, you are li just listen to Salim Reza Farhad Hussain. He is the managing director and CEO of Brack Bank Limited. We are you know, on the panel now over here onboarding the next 10 million banking customers uh, organized by Euclid Management Consultants, it's part of Convergence 2021, and it's based on the theme financial inclusion in the digital era. Thank you all for tuning in. So we have been listening uh, to three of our very valued panelists. So and again, now come back to our, our leader in the digital world, and that is uh, to Baba Daula. So we just heard from Salim a number of very good points that he made uh, regarding the uh, investment, the will, the bravery, the confidence of the bank boards to be able to spend this money in digital transformation in technology. And also that we have a dearth of uh, proper 
engineers. We have a lot of engineers, but properly tech savvy engineers, we lack them. In fact, even my own nephew, he started, he studied, you know, information technology and became a software engineer, but he went on to business. So his going into business is a loss for the country, I would like to say, people like him. So again, one more point I'd like to make before uh, Rubaba comes in is that the availability of laptops and smartphones in the hands of a younger generation to be able to be compute, to be able to learn coding and to go forward with all that we need from the fourth industrial revolution. So Rubaba, as you had uh, Oracle Bangladesh, how is your company looking at the Bangladesh uh, digital transformation scenario vis-a-vis -vis the banks and financial institutions? Over to you. Uh, yes, absolutely. We are totally focused on uh, helping and supporting the financial sector, uh, especially the banking sector with all kinds of technology. And uh, we would also like to transfer knowledge. And uh, for that, we have Oracle uh, Academy. We have... Um, Oracle University from where we provide um, various certification on these modern technologies so that uh, not only uh, employees of you know, large banks, but anybody who's interested uh, to get certified and understand more about this cutting edge technologies can actually make use of those courses. And we are also talking to some organizations and uh, we have partnered with some universities locally to provide those kind of uh, programs where we create more awareness and training around uh, you know, utilization of technology. So that's one part. Um, we have uh, discussed today about uh, training. We have discussed today about uh, uh, digital literacy and financial literacy. And again, I would really urge to think of the millennial, uh, the next generation who are uh, going to be coming into the um, uh, working space very soon and they're going to start earning, which method of uh, you know financial service are they going to use that's a question that we have to answer and the larger banks uh, who are mostly catering to clients who have larger portfolio and maybe uh, you know uh, larger ticket sizes for their financial services they have to now start thinking about how to bring in the millennials into this uh, entire ecosystem. And for that, we also have to create that kind of understanding within the students, within the uh, you know, uh, new professionals. And for that, we also look forward to doing partnership uh, with uh, various uh, uh, educational institutions and uh, carry out financial programs to teach them about financial uh, finance management, right? Uh, what I would like to just uh, share with you, you know, my son is 22 year old. He is part of that particular segment and he uses TD Bank in Canada, okay? And what I see is that he's actually glued to his mobile and using that app all the time. And I often ask him, what benefit do you get? He says, mom, I get all kinds of uh, combination and permutation of my uh, spending. I get to see whether I'm spending a lot on Uber Eats or is it on transformation? And I can put a bar and I can actually manage how I'm making use of my uh, allowances. So those are the things that these millennials are actually looking forward to having. That is how we're going to differentiate our services. It's not only just going digital, it's not only about being able to serve our customers through mobile phones. And the good part is in Bangladesh, and I was part of telecommunication for a long, long time, for 20 years. I've seen how we have expanded our services to rural base who didn't even know how to read and write, but they are making use of the services. Why? The demand was uh, created through simplicity, through ease of use, by taking away the barriers. Same thing we can actually do for financial inclusion as well. So as and when we make it much more easy to use, as and when we make it more relevant for the, that specific segment, only then we'll be able to get that demand. And then, of course, there will be a, a good balance between supply and demand. Rubaba, it's very heartening to hear from you of what Oracle is doing, the Oracle Academy, University certifications, uh, to introduce all the latest techniques into Bangladesh. So my request would be that as you go forward, now that we have this technology available of Zoom and so many other you know, digital medias, so that we can use this to start more enhanced training program for the younger ones and as the millennials just, you just said. And I very quickly looked up the next generation because I could not exactly remember. So as you spoke, so I Googled it. And so the next generation uh, after your son's generation uh, would be Generation Z. 
Generation Z, or maybe he's, your son is Generation Z now, because it says born between 1995 and 2012. And Generation Z, they say are Zoomers. They are Zoomers. So that's very interesting. With all these generations we have had, Generation X and Xenials and uh, Generation Y and Generation Z, these are very good, uh, you know, terms and very fascinating terms for people to use in universities. So coming to Asan Habib, so it is brilliant and long career in training. So you have come across all these various generations. What is your thoughts about the latest generation? What is your thought about BSPS of which you are an integral part, banking sector policy support? The, the young bankers have got together, uh, dear viewers, the young uh, bankers of Bangladesh, especially the graduates of Bangladesh Institute of Bank Management, they've got together and set up this BSPS. So they are all members, they do a lot of research and seminars. And what I like about them is they have a very long reach, very far reach. Their seminars, webinars are attended by thousands and thousands of people like the other seminars. So, and they have also got on the advisory board, senior government, you know, retired public servants, finance secretaries, uh, senior economists and senior bankers. And I'm also very privileged to serve as a part of the advisory board. And that's why I know about them. So Asan, you see all yeah. these people, what are your thoughts about the late, our, our younger generation now? Are they able yeah. to adapt? To this new fourth industrial revolution absolutely and this is practically uh, the way the bsps they they they're doing they're performing they're uh, conducting different programs that is really fascinating and they, this is these are really inspiring to i mean not only the future generation for us as well uh, why i'm saying this because uh, uh, sometimes we are skeptical. Sometimes uh, there are fear in our mind that, uh, the, I mean, what is the way our future uh, generation is driving? Uh, but thanks that they are moving towards the right direction. It is really necessary that we should show them the path. And I think in connection with this, uh, 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 I, I still remember we had a program as part of BSPS. I don't know whether Anisar was there or not on shadow banking that is clearly connected with today's topic. You all were talking about the support of the central bank. And we had a discussion on shadow banking and, uh, uh, and, and that particular platform. We presented a paper on that. And let me share with you that whenever we are talking about incorporating technology, using technology for financial inclusion, then one critical policy issue is shadow banking. All these are shadow banking activities like mobile financial services like uh, uh, we are as banking using ex extensive technology, including uh, a third party as part of this financial services. And there is a misconception that shadow banking is something bad. No, shadow banking is good banking. Shadow banking is very essential for financial inclusion, but these are simply less regulated. And from the policymakers perspective, the basic challenge is the thing that, that, were, uh, that was even uh, that put forward by uh, 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 Selim sir as well. The basic challenge is where the regulatory uh, uh, and supervisory, uh, uh, I mean, uh, uh, what, what should be the right kind of strategy, a regulatory and supervisory strategy to regulate these mobile financial services and as in banking and use of technology by the banks. Why? The regulation supervision should not be too stringent. They should not be discouraged. At the same time, this should not be so easy, simple. Otherwise, there could be uh, 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 instances of financial fraud. And it would be really difficult to handle all those financial fraud if the regulation is too weak, if the supervision is not that strong. So what is the right kind of line over there? So that is a critical area that is shadow banking. And I still remember they organized that event on shadow banking and we, we, we really had three proposals. And you know, yesterday's newspaper, we have seen that one, uh, there is, there is an, a case of uh, 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 200, uh, two, two crore of fraud, somebody fleed away with two crore of bank issues, uh, uh, end, I think. You see, uh, uh, and in the context of that, BS, BSPS was talking about our proposal. One of our core proposal as part of BSPS was that you have to monitor your SN very carefully because that is a shadow banking component. That is not highly regulated. It's your responsibility to monitor that, your responsibility to identify that. So that is another critical issue that we are supposed to consider at part of technology driven or, 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 or uh, using technology for financial inclusion.
Thank you. So your point is about cybersecurity. Uh, before you have physical fraud in the banks where you defalcate your cash or cook the bank's books, and still that this is going on. I know I've seen incidents in certain banks where books have been cooked and people have taken money and got caught. But uh, coming to Salim, now that we saw this big uh, you know, arrest, uh, massive arrest across the world, which was spearheaded by the world's leading intelligence agencies by planting uh, you know, phone calls, uh, phones and systems into this uh, cyber criminals' hands. So you are in this rapidly expanding quite large bank in Bangladesh, extensive network, extensive agent SME centers and agent banking centers, centers et cetera. So how do you see uh, cybersecurity as, and what measures have you taken to reinforce cybersecurity? Because there have been problems with your bank, there have been problems with my bank, and I had to face that also, you know, face the intelligence agencies in the country also when we had frauds uh, on our systems. So how do you feel about standarding these now going forward? What steps are you taking? Your Firstly, the investment in, in uh, cyber security is something that we only really started in a, in a, a significant manner for, after the central bank heist, which uh, is why you remember a few day, years ago. Prior to that, we always believed that Bangladesh was too small and too poor to attract the interest of these hackers or cyber criminals. Uh, but then we suddenly re woke up one day and realized that a hundred odd million dollars had been uh, taken away from the central bank of, of Bangladesh. And this could then happen to many other institutions. From that day onwards, at least BRAC Bank has been investing heavily, heavily in our cybersecurity setup in terms of people, in terms of processes, in, in terms of the actual technology use. And it is quite expensive. I might add here that although laptops and general computer technology, hard, hardware, for example, is, is not taxed very heavily to the best of my knowledge when it is imported into Bangladesh, software is still taxed very, very heavily. Duties on software and duties particularly on cybersecurity related software, uh, if I remember correctly, are anything between 50 to 60%. So that is some uh, an area where I feel perhaps one branch of the government is not fully aligned to the overall uh, digital Bangladesh uh, agenda. I think that needs to be uh, uh, looked into. But anyway, coming away, uh, coming back to what we were talking about in terms of cybersecurity. So we have invested heavily and most other banks are doing so. The fact of the matter is that no matter what you do, no matter how much you invest in cybersecurity, you will every now and then get into trouble. There, and banking itself is all about managing risks. So if you feel that you will never get bitten, you will never lose anything, then you're very, very wrong. This has to happen. This will happen. There will be operational costs. There will be operational losses. Uh, uh, credit losses, and today in today's world, cybersecurity related operational losses. You just have to find ways to minimize them. Uh, but it is going to happen. It's not a question of, of if, it's more a question of when. And um, every bank should be investing heavily in this area. Uh, otherwise, uh, that when will become very, very dangerous and difficult for everybody. Um, but coming back to um, less educated people and uh, their adoption of digital technologies, and Ispa, I'd like to share a small anecdote with, with all of you. A few years ago, I'm on the board of a company called Bikash, which is a subsidiary of Brack Bank. And um, uh, uh, about uh, three years ago, when Bikash first were about to launch their app, everybody was very apprehensive as to whether we could generate the appropriate numbers. And at that point in time, one of our partners insisted that we uh, get uh, uh, a million subscribers in the first year. And uh, we were thinking that was a target that was uh, much too onerous and we were looking for maybe a million customers in a two or three year period. So uh, a very simple, easy to use uh, Bangla and English app was launched 
uh, I think if it was in 2017 or 80 anywhere, forget, whatever be the case. And once the app was launched, Vikash actually onboarded a million odd customers in less than a month. So that's when we recognize that you do not have to be uh, very well educated to use technology. Uh, and less educated people are not stupid. They are quite intelligent. If your app, for example, your solution is, as Rubaba mentioned, simple, easy to use, friendly, then customers will take to it like a duck to water. And that's exactly what has happened to Bikash and its services. I might add here, Anis Bhai, in uh, we, Brad Bank, were relatively late entrants to the agent banking market. We only launched five or six years after some of the major players had launched uh, their solutions. And um, ours was in end 2019, December 2019. But our solution was digital 24 by seven. And although it's been slightly delayed by the 2020 pandemic, um, over the last 18 months, we've had a significant number of customers using this new app-based solution as well. And um, we find it has become a, not only a very popular with customers, uh, over, over 150,000 loans have already been uh, disbursed through the Brack Bank agent banking network in less than a year. And um, uh, very importantly, both the deposits and the loans are all commercially very, very viable, attractive for Bragg Bank as well. So technology is something that um, uh, uh, less well-educated people or lower income group people will also quickly uh, uh, get on board if the service itself is attractive, it's simple, and it makes sense for them. Let's not forget that they are not stupid. They're intelligent. They may be less well-educated than some people in, in Dhaka or Chittagong. But again, I repeat, as we found out with the Bikash app, if the app or the service is powerful and is friendly, then the customer will take to it very, very quickly. Thank you, Anis Bhai. Thank you, Salim. Again, excellent points. And I was almost wondering why Black Bank and you were not starting agent banking earlier, because I was very excited when I launched, uh, we launched agent banking in Mutual Trust Bank. And I, and I was always, always looking forward to going to the villages for opening the agent banking centers. And there were hundreds of people massed there, and they were very interested and very happy to find a bank agent near their home. And that the fact that we senior team had gone down there to their villages and they would take us home and you know entertain us with pita and you know pancakes etc so that's what i loved so but you came in late but then you learned along the way the pitfalls and you got the right technology so good luck to you and i'm sure you'll be extremely well with agent banking again with apps apps also to serve as a means of you know financial literacy as far as bikash is concerned also as you know digital literacy and illiterate people, even maids, you know, rickshaw pullers, they learn to use this Bikash app. So slowly they learn a little few words of English or Bengali. So I think they serve a very good educating role. And just to touch a little bit on uh, cybersecurity, in the old days, as I just mentioned, you had Bonnie and Clyde type movie type heists where you went and put a gun there. And I remember also in our bank, Iftikhar Ali Khan now, who is the CEO of an unbanking financial institution, he was a uh, manager of a branch. And then there were some hoodlums who went in and put a gun to his hand and said, hand over the money. And he had to hand over the money. So I remember that. But now there is the invisible force which can take millions, the dark enemy lurking in the deep web. You don't know where they are. So I think we have come to the towards the end of our uh, panel session. But before we go, I'll go around our panelists and uh, ask them for anything that they may wish to add on this subject. So first, Rubaba. Um, thank you, uh, Anis Bhai. Uh, this was a very, very interesting discussion. I've also learned a lot and, and gotten a lot of insight uh, through research and also, you know, uh, the banking sector, how they're thinking. Um, I'm very excited with the future of, of the uh, financial sector in Bangladesh, especially in this uh, new era where we are looking into digital transformation. We are one of the fastest growing economy in Asia. 
We have a large youth base, almost 40% of our uh, population is within the age group of uh, 10, uh, 19 to 24, uh, which is, they are our asset. And if we can really educate them properly, if we can give them the right means, I'm sure that we can definitely bring them into uh, the economy and uh, they can contribute uh, by large. The, another information or important point that I would like to point out is about women. Uh, and uh, uh, women's uh, financial inclusion. That's extremely important. 50% of our population um, uh, are women. And how can we include them in this particular sector? I see a lot of uh, banks, financial institutions focusing on giving loans, uh, collateral free loans, and various other services catering to actual need of, of um, uh, women and female entrepreneurs as well. I really want to see some uh, good numbers uh, not only uh, for tokenization, but actual benefit and impact that it creates um, in, in the life of uh, all the women entrepreneurs and women who are uh, becoming part of this uh, financial sector. Um, having said that, uh, we will continue to provide our support and partnership to the government and the uh, private sector. And we have seen in countries like Singapore, Hong Kong, you know, the regulators themselves have taken up programs for digital banking uh, implementation, uh, focusing on two things. One is, of course, uh, digital financial inclusion. How can we bring more uh, um, a population into it? And the second is unhappy bank customers. How can we make them more happy? So these are the two areas that we can also work together along with the regulators and, and uh, bring in a better uh, future for Bangladesh. Rubaba, with you at the helm of Oracle Bangladesh, I'm sure many good things will come and you are energetic and wherever you have gone, you have set a blazing records, blazing trail of success and we expect it from you. It's not that it's something normal for you. Uh, it's something normal for you, not exceptional. And going forward, you will do more things which will be exceptional. And what you again just said about uh, women entrepreneurs, women entrepreneurs, financial inclusion has been, I've been passionate about it, about rolling out products. Some of the names that I coined uh, for the women lady products, well, one was uh, MTB Gunovoti, MTB Bhagavati. These were names that I had coined and I loved those names. Somehow it came as an inspiration. And we trained ladies, we got them into a room and all those 40 ladies told us, uh, we had done this session with the SME Foundation that they had never been inside a bank. They are afraid to get inside a bank. So mm -hmm. I then appointed a lady officer to be in charge of training them. And she did a great, great job, you know, of starting this. Excellent point. Thank you. Uh, we then uh, go on to Asan Habib. Anything that you may wish to say? In yes. conclusion? Yeah, for banks and uh, financial institutions, let us invest on uh, technology driven transformation. In the short run, it could be expensive for you but in the long run definitely it is cost effective and practically you don't have any option to sustain let us train banks employees to cope up with the transformation let us focus on demand side with aggressive financial literacy campaign let us engage private sector and NGOs as well because this cannot be the job of the government only so let us engage private sector and NGOs to educate our demand side then probably in the long run, we'll having some qualitative change in financial inclusion, inclusion area in Bangladesh. Thank you. Thank you very much. Also, microcredit finance institutions, because they're well spread across the country. Yes, so sir. they should also take a role in the financial literacy, in addition to what you just said. Uh, we then uh, move on to our great banker, Salim Hussain, for concluding remarks. Uh, you're on mute, Salim. Um, just hang on a second. Thank you again. It's been great listening to yourself and Rubaba and Asan Habib Bhai. Um, I think we're all on the same page. Um, there's no doubt that this, uh, the, the, the entire concept of what digital Bangladesh is all about has received a great boost in 2020, although that, that was a very, very difficult period. And to a certain extent, some of that stress is continuing into 21. The fact is we now understand what the Honorable Prime Minister was propagating many, many years ago. None of us could believe that Bangladesh would be where we are today in terms of the digital capabilities that this country today offers. If you just look at it, even somebody in my age group, Anis Bhai, today, we buy, I buy everything virtually 
uh, online. My wife buys things online. We hardly go anywhere. Uh, everything is available online. You can make payments online. You can do much of your banking online. The need to go and get something and, and you know, out from outside, all this has changed. It's not just the banking sector, but the entire retail sector has changed, adapted. Today, there are thousands and thousands of online entrepreneurs. Many of them are actually women offering different uh, uh, services. Day before yesterday, I bought um, two toothbrushes and uh, two, uh, a, a packet of toothpaste as well online, and I paid 19 taka in, in, to the delivery boy. So, you know, why go, take out your car and go to the market and buy uh, two toothbrushes and a toothpaste when you can get it for 19 taka in, in an hour or two? So everything in terms of the digital profile in this country has changed. You'll be surprised that even the courts on his way today have virtual sessions. The government is operating on their, what is it, I think, NOTI that they use. Almost 40, 50% of all their activities are now uh, documented through digital means. So the country has moved forward enormously in the last 15, 16 months. And we are in a really exciting period because I see going forward, this agenda will expand enormously. You will see every part of Bangladesh take on board digitalization, use it to make something or sell something, to build a service proposition, whatever, whatever. It's, and, and that is not going to be restricted just to banks alone. And those institutions, those shops, those entrepreneurs who are today not moving digital are going to become completely irrelevant in the coming years. So I think Bangladesh will move forward very, very quickly over the next few years. And this space, I think everybody will simply have to watch this space and see how many new players come in and how the entire customer behavior across all segments, all sectors will change very dramatically. And, I, and that's not only for millennials. Let me share with you a couple of pieces of information. In January 2020 in BRAC Bank, 17% of all our transaction volumes on ISBI were digital or alternative in nature. Today, it is 59% in 15 months. Today, 93% in terms of numbers of transactions of all transactions in Brad Bank are digital or alternative in nature. This is the change that has happened in a 15 month period. And it has mainly happened because the customer behavior has changed. We've also been able to offer services, but the fact of the matter is customer behavior has changed. Our uh, internet banking onboarding today is 10 times higher per day than what it was in 2019. And Anis Bhai, a very large portion of that customer base is over 50 years of age. So it's not just young people who are moving digital. It is every other person and it is people who are in their 50s and 60s who are also learning that this is a better way to do their banking or do something else, buy something else than what they were doing in the past. So I think the future for Bangladesh is very exciting. Much depends upon how our education systems can adapt to this change and, and generate more um, appropriate resources, professionals, uh, uh, engineers, data scientists, et cetera, et cetera, uh, 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 experts, professionals like that. Uh, so we are looking forward to that happening. But I think the government and the regulator are generally on the right track. It's now up to all the private sector players to also come on board and work together to, to make the, the idea of the vision of digital Bangladesh complete within the next couple of years. Absolutely fascinating, Salim, what you just said. And congratulations uh, for the ch changes that you have made for the better uh, in your transaction volumes. Just two days ago, I read that in America, during the COVID era, 
they only moved from 50 to 54 percent of digital transactions. So Bangladesh is doing better. So let us congratulate you, congratulate ourselves, our people, and our elderly people for adapting to change. We live in very interesting times, and we have lived through interesting times. We were lived. Uh, we started in the banking when we had those NCR 299 cards, and then. As you remember, I and you, we were part of the transformation. We went into PC Bank, we went into CBS, and so many countries we went to so hard we had to work. And then we had to downgrade the computer again when Standard Chartered took over ANZ Bank to the BBS system. So we have seen through all that, and now we see the world of Oracle, you know, the, such fantastic organizations. Uh, so dear viewers, you have been listening to this panel, panel discussion, panel discussions. Uh, organized by Euclid Management Consultants, Convergence 2021, based on the theme financial inclusion in the digital era. And our subject today was onboarding the next 10 million banking customers, which brought in a number of other subjects of financial literacy, digital literacy and the future and cybersecurity. So thank you all for joining in and listening to us. And for me, it was really a great pleasure moderating this session because all the three panelists who very kindly joined us happened to be extremely close to me in many, many ways. So I felt at ease, I felt comfortable. It was like talking at home, like I would talk with my own family members. You are also like family members to me by now. So it was wonderful being able to moderate this and listening to your views. I'm sure the viewers will, have also, will also learn along the way. And I would like to thank uh, Euclid Management Consultants for organizing this and especially Tirtham Dev who works very hard, relentlessly to organize this very smoothly. So again, dear panelists, thank you all for your very valuable time. Thank you viewers for tuning in. With all those words, stay well, stay safe, wear a mask and practice social distancing. We formally end the panel here. Thank you.